But I think that's really where IFTDIS can be quite powerful by providing those, those pictures where we can put our finger on the map and say, this is an area that's going to cause me problems. How are we going to mitigate it? So that's kind of what I'm after with this presentation. OK, so I'm going to try to whip through some of this. And then, like I said, I'd like to show a demo if I have time. And if not, we'll just stick to the slides. I can't see the chat, so I know, and like I said, I know you guys aren't typing on the chat thing, but if any of the other instructors have a comment, please just chime in because I, I can't see that right now. And feel free to chime in if you have some comments. It's the more the merrier here. So learning about IFTDIS, just want to start off with places you can go find more information. If you're interested in this stuff or feel like you want to learn a little bit more, we have a ton of help in the IFTDIS uh, Help Center. Uh, you just click on the link at the top of the screen um, in IFTDIS, and that'll take you right there. You don't even have to be logged in. Um, so we have a lot of help in there that's really great. There's videos, there's tutorials, there's all kinds of things. We also have two uh, online courses in the learning portal. Um, there's one that was just up, updated, the IFTDIS overview for 2023, and that gives you a very good general overall picture of how IFTDIS works. And I have one in there that's sort of in draft format, that's how to use IFTDIS for your prescribed fire plans. So that's a little more targeted to what we are talking about today. Uh, but you can do those, they're both self-study, you don't have to have anything special, you can just go in there and do them at your own pace or just do parts of them. We also have a ton of recorded webinars, and this is actually going to be recorded and will be posted also. So if there's anything you wanted to go back and look at, you can do that. So lots of help out there for these things. So I want to start off with this quality assurance checklist. This is the, the part of the review that really pointed out some of these spatial things that IFTDIS can help with. And uh, so I'm not going to read through all this stuff. I just want to make kind of make an awareness and a tie in that that this kind of all does go together. Um, in this example, it's element four and we're talking about fuel models. I know this came up in your all's little breakout groups earlier today um, when you're talking about ways to look at fuels outside of the unit, fuels inside of the unit, that type of thing. So that's what we're going to focus on with these um, this, these checklist items. I think the thing to keep in mind, though, with a lot of this is these are really just best management practices whether we had an escape last year and had a review or not, most of these things in here are, are pretty general best management practices across the board. I've been talking to some folks in Region 4. They're going to be doing a prescribed fire workshop also, looking at planning like this. And that's kind of the, the approach they're taking is, you know, they work with a lot of non-forest service partners, as we all do. And, uh, you know, they may or may not be beholden to some of these outputs from the from the review, but overall it doesn't matter. These are still best management practices and stuff we should probably try to incorporate in our planning. Um, so that's, I just want to kind of keep that in mind for everybody as we as we look at this as kind of a package deal. So the five elements that IFTDIS can do a really good job, I think, helping with in your plan are um, the description of the fire area, the, the prescription element, element seven, and then the other three that are circled here are element 11, which is your organization and equipment, the holding and the contingency element. And the reason I circled those is I'd really like to think about those as kind of a package deal. When you write a holding and a contingency plan, if you do those first and then think about your organization, um, it can really it can really roll together pretty nicely and pull a lot of the pieces in that sometimes we think of separately when we shouldn't be. So that's why I kind of think of those as a package, and I'll talk about that as I go through some of these pictures. OK, so I'm going to use an example, thanks to Stacy Tyler up here on the Sawtooth. This is a burn unit that's south of um, southeast of Twin Falls, um, so southern Idaho, and uh, it's on, like I said, it's on the Sawtooth. I think this plan has been approved at this point. They're trying to find a window to implement it, um, but I think it's a really, oh, sorry. OK, there's it's a really nice example, um, a pretty typical, I think, of, of not, not maybe not everything, uh, maybe not anything's typical anymore. But I think this provides a really good example of um, a variety of fuel models, a variety of terrain, and then some some resource values that I think we'd all find very common on what we what we have on our our local areas. 
So that's what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this burn unit and you're going to see, I'm going to use this example throughout everything that I'm going to show you here. So this is a picture from Google Earth with the burn unit boundary on it. Um, and we're looking to the north and you can kind of see the terrain, the, uh, you know, the, the slope, the aspect, everything's kind of leaning to the north. Um, there's a bunch of ag out to the, obviously on the outside of the forest boundary and uh, not a ton of values, a few values. And I'll point those out here as we go. But you, anyway, you kind of get a lay of the land. So this is called Stinson Creek. And, uh, and that, like I said, that's the example we'll use throughout. So this first element, element four, I'm kind of going to walk through these four elements or these five elements really. And uh, again, starting with this quality assurance checklist or like I keep saying kind of more of this best management practice. But the whole crux of this, and I, like I said, you guys talked about this earlier, I think in um, the early part of the day, but the, the big questions to answer are, do the fuel models that you have on your in your plan, first of all, do they make sense? Are they are they what's really out there? And the, the other part of that is, do they make sense based on the fire behavior that you're that you expect to see? And I think that's where people sometimes think, well, I picked this fuel model, that's what it is. But for whatever reason, you've got a lot of professional opinion and expertise out there that says, I know that fuel model is going to burn just a little bit differently because it's wetter or it's on an aspect that um, is a lot drier, perhaps. So there's things that are, you know, part of picking a fuel model, but then adding that expertise to it, because the real point is to get the fire behavior out of it that you're really looking for. So that's part of it is, is your rationale for picking that fuel model based on the expected fire behavior. And then if I'm going to show you the maps here that we get out of IFTDIS with land fire, and oftentimes we'll look at those maps and we'll go, that's not what's out there. I know that's not what's out there. And that's fine. That that's that's fine. Land fire is our starting point. From there, we have to go in and make adjustments based on what we know is actually going on on the ground. So I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. So that's really the key, I think, to a lot of this. And of course, looking inside of your unit and then more broadly outside of your unit, probably more importantly for the burn boss perspective. I mostly care about what's going on outside of my burn unit, to be honest, when it comes to being a burn boss. So in IFTDIS, this is the template um, that includes element four. And I think the three areas in the template that IFTDIS can really help inform are like that physical description part where we've got the topography, um, you're trying to describe kind of what it looks like. Then certainly section B, which is that on-site and adjacent fuels. Um, and then the breakdown, how much of what fuel model is out there on the ground? Um, we, we, a lot of people just use a table with a bunch of numbers in it, and that's fine. But if you use the little bar chart that's over here, it's a much more visual way to explain. Um, in this case, you can see right off the bat, we've got a lot of uh, TU5, which is that timber understory model. Um, and that stands out to me right away by looking at that. So I, then I can think in my mind, well, is that really what's out there on the ground? Um, versus trying to do percentages and things. To me, I'm a very visual person. To me, having a lot of pictures um, makes my life a lot easier. So that's why I like to use some of these outputs. I'm going to walk through each of these with you. Um, let's see. So, and then the last part, of course, is the maps, right? The things we like to stick in the appendix. So in this case, this is elevation in IFTDIS. You just click the layers on, um, on the left-hand side on your menu. So here's elevation. Here's aspect, and aspect can be really important, right? Because it can really influence how much fuel moisture you have. You know that I showed you that Google Earth image, and this this burn unit is actually has a lot of north facing element to it. So that that's gonna that's gonna impact your fire behavior. Maybe it's holding more snow in the spring if you're gonna do a spring burn. Um, so aspect can be quite important. It might be something you want to describe in that element four. And then of course the fuel models. So this is the initial fuel model when I just grabbed the land fire data in IFTDIS. And this is, the, this is what I got. So I, you know, thinking about this and talking with the folks that know this burn unit really well, you know, the first question is, what do you guys think? Here's the break, you know, here's what's here. And, uh, you know, we've, and again, I'll show you the breakdown of what's, um, 
the uh, the, the colors are. But remember, we had a lot of timber understory in uh, five, which is the dark green. So the question became, is that right? And their answer to me was, well, yeah, actually, that's right. However, let me switch to the next screen. They did a big slashing project out there. So this da that data from Landfire was from uh, 20, let's see, that would have been 2016. And they had subsequently done um, a, 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 a treatment out there because, because they wanted to use that treatment to get better fire effects. The idea behind this burn is to um, enhance elk habitat and enhance um, uh, aspen repro reproduction. So they wanted to slash that area so they'd get better consumption um, and help and help promote that aspen reproduction. So they went in and did a treatment here. Um, that's why it's kind of outlined in purple. And so of course that treatment came after the land fire data. So we had to go in and make those changes um, on the map to say, oh, that that went from a TU5 and it's actually a slash model now. It's more of an, an SB model, which is a slash model. So we just went in and made that change and said, okay, we know that's what's actually on the ground. The really important thing here though, is it's extremely different from what's outside of the burn unit. Um, obviously that was done inside of the burn unit for those fire effects, but the fuels around the unit stayed the same. So that's gonna, we're gonna have some very different fire behavior inside and outside of our unit because of that. The other thing was this Doug, Douglas fir stand that's on kind of the east side and they also felt because of that north facing aspect, there, there was a lot of moisture in there. It held moisture for a long time and they didn't feel like it was going to burn like a timber understory five was going to burn. They thought it was going to burn more like a timber litter model. So we made an adjustment on the map also to reflect that change because we expected different fire behavior. So if it just allows you to do that, you can evaluate the fuels. Um, do your ground truthing, walk around, fly around the unit, whatever you need to do, and come back and make those adjustments so you know when we do our modeling, we're going to get the fire behavior we expect. So that's always really important um, to do, no matter what kind of work we're doing, what model we're using, or what tool we're using. So these are the reports that we get out of FDDIS that show us the breakdown. We've got little thumbnail images, we've got the bar charts, we've got the pie charts, you know. Get to pick your flavor. If you're more of a pie chart person, you can go with that. Um, and then from there, you can take that before and after look. In this case, like I said, we had the before we did any editing, and then after we changed that to that slash model and changed our dug fur around. So it was less, it wasn't going to burn as hot as that timber understory model. And now we can look at the differences in the uh, in the graph. So this this is actually kind of the NEPA part, right, of our work. But this all plays into what we're going to put into our burn plan. So ultimately, in our burn plan, we're going to do something like this. We made a bunch of changes. We did some mechanical treatment. And now I'm writing my element four of my, of my plan. And I'm just going to go ahead and drop these um, thumbnails right into my plan, into that element. So I can write my little paragraph of discussion, but tie it to a picture, right? Picture is worth a thousand words. And here we go. You know, it makes it, it makes me writing. You know, I have to write a lot less if I do it this way. Um, I can caption these images and write a, a very short description, and then the picture sort of tells the story. So that's kind of what the approach that was taken um, with this element with this particular unit. So I think that's a, a nice way to save us some writing and uh, and really tell our story better. Okay, so that is the element four. So in element seven, with our prescription, again, back to the, the prescribed fire review and some of the this uh, this checklist stuff, again, to me, the stuff in bold that I have is, is really kind of the take home message part. You know, when we write our prescription, and I, this was mentioned early in the day too, we want to write our prescription so we meet our objectives, obviously, but we also have to provide for that perimeter control. Right. What are what are the maximums that we're we're willing to deal with that we know we can keep it inside the box? And if you just allows you to play with that quite a bit in a very visual way. So I'm going to show you that here in a second. Another take home from the review was the crown fire potential, depending on your fuel type, of course. If you have the types of fuels that you might, you could get some passive torching or active crown fire, which would be 
most of us probably aren't burning under conditions where we're going to have that kind of behavior, but it does happen. Um, but we can look at that in IFTDIS. You can do it in BEHAVE also. There is a crown module in BEHAVE, but it's not spatial, right? It'll give you numbers, but it won't show you where. And that's, to me, again, the key with, with using some of these spatial tools. Then you can also tie these prescription parameters back to the work we might want to use contain for. And that's when we're trying to figure out our resources, right? Our resource needs for holding and such. And again, rolling these back into that sort of best management mindset. So let me walk you through some examples with the prescription part, saying we're still going to stick with this um, Stinson Creek uh, burn unit. So the way I like to think about this, this modeling stuff, for those of you who took 390 way, way, well, not way back when, they just recently changed the class, but we used to do nomograms, right? And we, we would pick an input, and then we draw our little box around the nomogram, and depending on our input, whether it's a low fuel moisture, or high fuel moisture, the box and the nomogram would get bigger or smaller. Well, essentially, that's what behave is. All, all behave did was take those and turn it into a computer. <laughs> so you didn't have to draw the boxes anymore. You just put in the inputs and it gives you the numbers on the output side. So that's kind of what behave does. That's a very simplified version of what behave is. It does other things also, but generally speaking, that's that's what behave does, at least for the surface fire spread stuff. If in the in the in the spatial modeling, it basically took behave, it took nomogram, then behave, and it's doing exactly that thing, but it's doing it for each 30 meter pixel on the map. So it's taking into account slope and aspect and elevation and fuel type. And it's doing that for each 30, 30 meter pixel on the map. So that's what you get. So rather than having a number in a table, you get a color on the map in a square. So that's what we see in this upper right hand corner. In that case, we're looking at flame length. So it's a visual representation, pixel by pixel, of what you might get in Behave. So you can just see from that right now, if I had a question about where my highest flame lengths are going to be, I can just look at that map and I can see where they are. In my opinion, oftentimes we get very hung up on the numbers, and numbers can be important, but location and spatial you know, variation is probably more important when it comes to some of this. So that's how these sort of things work together. So for the prescription, when we have our when I have our template, and the template doesn't provide much, right? You have to go to the guide and really read about how we tease out these very three kind of very small bullets that we have in our template. And most of the time, this is what we end up with is a table, right? We end up with a table of our inputs, our, our, our weather, and then we end up with a table of our prescription outputs, which are the numbers. And when we put numbers in like this in the outputs, Remember, there, when you're using this sort of table approach, you're making a very general statement about, in this case, uh, flame length. So on the cool end, this table says 0.8, which I'd say one, right? One, one foot flame lengths. And on the hot end, as they wrote this one, it says 4.6. So I like to round up. I'm a whole number person when it comes to this thing. So I'd say five. So in, in my case, I'm saying I have a range of one to five. Well, you just saw the map that I showed you in IFTDIS, and it's actually, to just use two numbers is a little bit of a generalization that might not really cover the nuance of what you're after. So instead, my recommendation is if you want to play around with IFTDIS, and this isn't that hard, the inputs are still the same in IFTDIS, it just, point, it just spits out the map. So in this case, we have a compare weather feature in IFTDIS where you can, um, you can show these things next to each other. So what I did is I went and I ran three different um, sets of parameters for my prescription. And I ran a low, a moderate, and a high. And this came from the burn plan that they did there on the sawtooth. Um, and now I can look at them next to each other. So yeah, I can still get numbers with the legend over here. Green is zero to one, red is greater than 25, but I can see where. And that really matters to me as a burn boss. So we're going to tie this into our holding plan here in just a second. And you can see why knowing where these numbers occur is really quite important. And I can, if I'm talking to my, maybe I'm talking to a biologist or some, some other resource person about 
picking my prescription if I'm supposed to meet these kind of ecological objectives. You know, we can talk about this now and, and look at it on the map together and say, hey, we're going to get these higher flame lengths on this end of the unit. You know, given our ecological objectives, is that OK? And uh, and then you can do some adjustments from there. So that's how the compare weather feature works in uh, IFTDES. So let me walk through some examples here um, and how it might tie back into the actual burn plan and then the holding holding plan. So for me, what I did is talking with the folks on the sawtooth is they have their table just like we did on the other example I showed you. But then I also went ahead and added in the images so I can actually view them, you know, and look at the picture as it relates to the numbers that I got. So I still can come up with some ranges, but now I can also look at the picture. So I got flame length on the top and rate of spread on the bottom. And I would just drop these into a screen capture and just put these right into my plan. OK, so that's sort of the prescription part. Now what I want to do is shift over to holding. I feel like in the old days, the prescription used to be sort of the crux of writing a plan. But I think over the, in my mind now, my, my opinion has changed on that. And I actually think the holding plan it should be really where you should be spending a bunch of our time because again, it all ties together. So going back to the checklist again, um, this was kind of the take homes for me anyway from that checklist that we really need to spend some time examining fire behavior on that map. And again, decide putting our finger on that map and saying, if I'm the room boss and I'm talking to the person who's going to be the holding boss, let's look at some of these outputs and say, OK, Here's a theme. This this is going to be a problem area. And uh, from there, I can write my my stuff in my plan or I could send folks out to the field or I'm going to go out to the field and go, let's go look at that in person and make sure that that's actually what we think it might be. Um, or maybe I know this came up earlier in the day, too. Maybe there's something that the models aren't picking up. Like I know there's this little saddle that's going to cause us some problems. Why is that not showing up in the model? Because I want to, I want to show that in my plan. So it goes both ways, right? We want to run the models, look at the, go out in the field and walk around, but then also come back and and do the kind of do it back and forth. Um, again, the other part I mentioned was that location can often be more important than the actual number that we get, and this also gives you the ability to game out some of these events that we might not expect. You know, we always talk about these. Um, low probability, high consequence events. I actually like for prescribed fire, I like to talk about high probability, high consequence events, things that are likely to happen. Maybe we do get some gusty winds and stuff. Maybe that's pretty common. Well, let's game that out and see how that might affect some of this planning. Um, so I think with using it, thinking about our prescription parameters, tying that to holding, we, we can do that. OK, so let me walk through some of these examples. I'm hoping I'm, I'm kind of hurrying because I kind of want to show you some of this this live here. So for the holding plan, again, remember I talked about at the beginning about thinking about element 11 and 11 element 16 as a package deal and maybe even contingency. I didn't include that one here, but um, so for my holding, I might probably spend a lot of time on my holding plan before I start plugging in stuff for my element 11. So this is the holding plan now out of the Forest Service template. Um, and what was added was this critical weather step up plan. That's that's part D at the bottom. So we've always had that critical holding points and actions section. And I think I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to walk through some examples here to show you how you can do that. But then that other critical weather step up plan is where you can start plugging in some of those events that you might know just because you're from that area, right? Hey, we always get this type of wind during this type time of year. So let's game that out and play with it. Um, so that's that's where I want to plug these two pieces in. And uh, and even as you're writing the plan again, dropping some of these images directly into your plan can really help tell that story. So back to our Stinson Creek burn unit. So what I have here on the screen now is some steps, right? Step one is just running those prescribed fire parameters, just like you wouldn't behave. Uh, but we're doing it in nifty disk now and we're getting our outputs. So these are my moderate prescription parameters. And you can see these are my numbers I used for uh, fuel moistures, 789 as far as tens, hundreds, 
or ones, tens, and hundreds, and then my live fuel moistures. And I'm using a 15 mile an hour wind out of straight out of the out of the west. So that's so the same things you'd plug into behave. Um, but what I added here on the map was the green dashed line is the forest boundary, both on the west and the east side. And you can see the burn unit is kind of sandwiched right in there. It's not very far. We're less than a mile to the west, and we're only about a half mile here to the east. So if part of our goal is to keep this thing on the forest, then those the proximity of that um, boundary is pretty important. We also have a structure here to the north, and then a little further away, about five miles away to the east and three miles to the west, uh, there's actually some, some private land and some buildings and homes and farms and stuff. So I want to know where I need to look out a ways to understand that. So that's step two is identifying those values. Then from here, I, all I'm going to do is walk through my prescription. So in this case, I put in my, my high end of my prescription. And this is that compare weather feature again. And I circled the area. So this is flame length. And I'm basically just circling the areas on the map that I'm going to get these higher flame lengths. So potential problem areas um, on the high end of my prescription. And again, the numbers, you can look up the numbers. You can click on the map too, and it'll give you that number for that particular pixel if you need those numbers. But to me, the, what I'm trying to do here is just get kind of get a theme going. So this is the high end of my prescription. And keep these, keep where these circles are in mind, because we're going to walk through each of these examples. This is the low end of the prescription. So I, I skip the middle because it's going to fall somewhere in the middle here. But the low end for flame length, hmm, same thing, a little bit on the east, a little bit on the west. So I'm still having some higher flame lengths even under the low end of my prescription. So keep that in mind. Now let's look at rate of spread. Hmm, look at that, high end of my prescription. Same deal. That east end seems to be popping up as a theme, right? And now in this case, I circled this one down here because it's a new area that I didn't see before. Um, I got some higher rates of spread down here as well. And I still do on this east side also. I didn't circle them, but you can see the higher, you know, the little red and orange pixels over here. So again, that's the high end. Low end, rate of spread. Um, look at that. So that west side pops up again. East side's a little better on the low end. Now, if we look at crown fire potential um, on the high end of my prescription, and I've got this, and it's because of the fuel type that's, remember, they did all that slashing inside of the unit, but outside of the unit, the fuels didn't change. So I've got this higher uh, probability of some crown fire potential, whether that's, you know, passive, just torching, maybe throwing spots, or actually, you know, maybe having a short little run if it were to get in there under the right conditions. And you can see what I did here is um, by clicking on the map, you, this, you can't see it, I'm sure it's hard to see, but there's a dot I clicked on here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but it's in this uh, blue circle. I can pull up the all of the information that goes with that particular pixel. That's what all this stuff is here. So I can see what the slope, elevation, the fuel model, canopy cover, I can look at the uh, flame length here. Um, and then what the wind speeds were when we put in the uh, information. So that's what you can do. You can click all over the map and get this information in IFTDIS. So that's the high end. On the low end for Crown Fire, again, that theme keeps arising. This west side in the central part of that west line, and then this northeast corner. So when we take all of that as a package, flame lengths and rates of spread and Crown Fire behavior, and we put it all together, Again, what is that theme? Where are these places that I should be really considering when I'm when I'm going out in the field to look at this stuff? And you can see, for me anyway, the theme is sort of this west and east side, for the most part. Whether that it doesn't matter. I took the names off of here because it doesn't matter whether it's flame length or rate of spread. The point is, is that there's some fire behavior in those places that might cause me problems, and I want to figure out what's going on. Maybe I need to do some mitigation. And then there's a few other maybe secondary places, this north central uh, line and then this south kind of southwest side. So that's why I use this sort of as like, give me the theme and what's happening. Coupled with that is you guys may have seen this layer called potential control locations. 
This comes up a lot in suppression, but we also have it available in IFTDIS. And you can just turn the layer on. It's it's mapped for the whole western part of the country. It's not available in the east right now, but in the west you can turn it on. And the potential control location layer basically gives you it's a um, it's a scale of zero to one um, and gives you sort of an index of uh, you know of how how light how um, where is the best place if you had to control a fire where would that happen and it, for the most part, it follows roads and terrain and access, um, things like that. So you can kind of see. So again, that east side, remember that came up as a theme. You can see the dark red is a low potential control. So that means backing off to some of these road systems where it's a little easier. And then same thing on the west side. Remember, we had that area that came up as our little theme. And again, not a lot of great access in there. So potential control location, you might have to back off. This is going to play again into your holding and your contingency plan. Then the second part of these layers that you can use is the suppression difficulty index. And that's basically the how hard is it to, to control a fire. Um, so this, you, again, you can kind of see a similar thing going on here as well. A little bit less of a problem on the east maybe than the other layer showed. But the west side for sure, and this has to do with terrain. I'll show you a Google Earth image on why this looks like this. So that's kind of how I use these outputs to really think about uh, my holding plan as it ties to my prescription. Because um, remember, I just ran this under pres regular prescription, low, moderate, high. So taking those outputs, writing my holding plan, um, yeah, you know, I just dropped some of these images again into the actual document. And you'd have to pick and choose and decide what what's the thing that best tells your story um, in order to decide what you should put in here. You don't want to put everything in because, of course, your your plan would get way too long. You can put this stuff in the appendix, and I think that's fine, too. Um, but if there's a key thing you really want to point out, the things get lost in the appendix. So I always try to encourage folks to take the things that really tell the story and go ahead and put that in the body of the document. Um, you kind of have to be a little choosy about it, like I said, because your, your document would get really long. Um, but go ahead, if it helps tell your story, use a picture to tell it. Save yourself some writing. Okay, so that's kind of the, the main stuff I wanted to show you in the slides. What I'd really like to do, I know we have about 10 minutes left. Um, what I really want to do is hop over to IftyDisk really quick and just click some buttons. So I'm going to get out of this. And you guys, I hope there's not, if it's too laggy, we'll skip it. But if it's working, then I'll go for it. And I also have some Google Earth I wanted to show you. Okay, so let me switch my screen. I know I got you guys all after lunch. Hopefully I'm keeping you awake. Um, okay, let's see here. Is it, am I still logged in? Oh, how long you, I am, that's fabulous. Okay, here we go. So uh, can you guys now see the IFTDIS map? You should see a map of CONUS. Yes. Got it. All right. Fabulous. Good. OK, so we're going to go over to my project. So now I'm in IFTDIS. Um, if you ever need help, you click up here. You go to the Help Center. It pops up in a new window. And you can go search for whatever it is that's causing you trouble. I'm going to switch back here. So that help is always available. I'm in the thing called the workspace right now, which is where all of my files are located. So I'm gonna I'm gonna probably click through this pretty quickly, but I just kind of wanted you guys to see it see it live. Um, so everything I'm storing for this project I'm showing you is in this folder. And what I want to show you is the uh, the compare weather thing. So let me quick click through a few of these. I'm gonna pick one of my model outputs. And I'm, what I'm gonna use now is the um, is the minimum travel time model. So this is a little more advanced and I'm more just showing you this because I want you guys to know what's possible out there. Um, I think everything I showed you already is very doable for folks who are even beginners at this or just want to look at the map a little bit. Um, this part I'm going to show you is a little more advanced and you might want to tap into somebody who's more of an analyst or more of an FBAN or an LTAN or someone locally or at the regional office that can maybe help you with some of these things. But I mostly want to show you this because I think to show you what's possible. And um, it also might give you some 
uh, reason to ask for it. Hey, I'd really like to get that MTT run because I've got this point of concern on my plan that I'd really like to tease out more. So it gives you, so you know it's there, so you kind of know what to ask for. So this model, what does, it actually spreads the fire. So what I like to use these for is spot, kind of spot fires. What happens if one of those areas, my little theme that popped up, right, that northeast corner of that unit, I'm like, hmm, that, that might cause me some problems. What if I do get a spot fire there? That's what I'm gonna use this for. So the way this works is we go into uh, IFTDIS and we pick the model that we wanna run and we create our run. I'm just gonna show you this. Then I'll, I, I, I kind of did this like Julia Childs. I ran a whole bunch of stuff already so I can pull it out of the oven and show you what it looks like when it's cooked. Um, but, but until then, let me show you just real quick how it's not that hard. Um, so basically what I do is I find my, uh, my landscape that I created and I grab that and you can see it'll pop up on the map on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, just like in behave, this is where I'm going to put in my inputs. So I put in my wind. I decide what kind of crown fire I'm using and you can read about any of these things. If you're not sure, you can click on the little question mark. Um, fuel moistures. You have to put those into behave also put them in here into if this same thing. Um, and in this case, what I'm doing is I have to tell it how long do I want the model to run for? Um, so I, I'm going to tell it two hours. So I fill in all my stuff. Then I run it and now I'm going to do I'm going to pull this the lasagna out of the oven here and show you what it looks like now that it's cooked. So in this one. The output I use, this is our moderate prescription parameters. So just that middle ground of my uh, of my prescription. And what I'm going to show you is rate of spread. Because we're going to tie, because I want to tie this a little bit back to um, maybe using contain potentially in order to figure out what resources I might need. So turning on, I'm going to change the map layer to uh, more of a Google Earthy thing. And let me zoom out just a little bit so we can see it. So what I did is I picked those spot fires on the northeast corner and I picked one on the west side. Remember my problem areas that I identified using that the just the basic um, landscape fire behavior stuff. And I said, OK, spot fire, I want you to run for two hours and we're going to use just our moderate prescription. So this is just what would happen if we were burning under those regular conditions. And you can see we have, a, you know, we've got some growth here in two hours. Um, I have a little measure tool that I can use so I can grab that guy and I can measure from my spot fire to the edge. And in two hours, it went about a third of a mile. Or a quarter mile, depends on where you pick kind of on the edge of the spot. So in two hours, I had about a quarter mile, you know, of of growth. So that that can be useful. So now I know and then I can also this is that little identify tool up here that little um, where I can click on it and figure out um, what my rate of spread was. I can do it from the colors right yellow, but I can just say I'm going to click on this yellow here and now it's going to show me that. Um, you see my rate of spread was 13 chains an hour on that particular spot, so I could go back to my production tables and sort of do my own version of contain where I go, well, if this thing's running at 13 chains an hour, what types of resources would I need to get around something like that? Or I could just go into contain and behave and just run my contain model. But at least now I've got it tied to a location. And I think those things can be really powerful when you put those things together. So you can do a, you can use this tool a lot of different ways. But this little, so this was, remember, this was a west wind, a straight, uh, wind out of out of the west. So you can see the spot fire, of course, that I put on the west side just burned back into the unit, which is what we would expect to happen. So not not terribly concerned about this west side with a west wind. But this east, this northeast corner is a little more of a of an issue. So now, so what I did is I went in and I ran three different runs using my different prescription parameters. And that compare weather tool in IFTDIS. So hang with me as I click through a few things. Um, I've got this compare weather tool, and that's where, again, you, you look at them side by side. 
So I'm going to go to my workspace. I already ran this again. We're pulling the lasagna out of the oven here. And I'm just going to go ahead. You have these filters up here that make things really easy to find stuff. So this is my um, my my spread comparison. And I'm going to look at that here on the uh, on the map. Let me add in my boundary so it's easier to see. And I want to look at rate of spread. And sorry, we're actually having a little issue with this. The thumbnails are not showing up. So just hang with me on this. I'm going to go to the map here in just a second. But you can see I've got three different options, um, left, middle, and right. And basically they are my regular okay. prescription, then a prescription where I amped up the winds to about 15 miles an hour to see if I got these gusty winds, what would happen. And then I did another one where the wind switched on me and went came out of the other direction. So let me go to the map. It'll be easier to see this. Um, so you just you, you line this up, you run it, you give it a name, you save it, and then you can go to the map. Hopefully that's not too laggy. And now, hold on a second, let me zoom out again. Done. Okay, so this is my original that I just showed you. So that's with just that wind that is, um, that's a regular, just my regular prescription. Okay, so I looked at that, that's good. Now this next one is, you can see it says 25 miles an hour. I added another 10 miles an hour to the wind. What happens if I got a wind gust or something I didn't expect? Um, everything else remaining the same. The only thing that changed is the wind. You can see my spread distance is quite a bit further now. So that's that's informative. Okay, that's some gusty wind action. Now what happens if I the wind switched on me? and I got a wind out of the east. Now I've got this issue here on the west side of my burn. So you can start playing with these things based on you know, your own knowledge of the burn unit area and uh, you know, in what areas you know might cause you problems. Then you can take all of this information and you can look at it. Let me show you this in Google Earth really quick. And that'll be the last thing I show you here. Um, but I think this can be really helpful too, because now we can look at things with a little different perspective. Let's see, hopefully, oops, that's not what I wanted. Wrong one. Hang with me. Almost there. Google Earth Pro, there we go. Okay, so hopefully you're looking at Google Earth now. And so this again, here's my burn unit, and we can just use Google, Google Earth like we usually do. And what I have turned on, I was you can export these out of IFTDIS and put them into Google Earth. And what I've got here is the there's the is the prescription parameters. The green is just the regular. And then the yellow is when I added that extra 10 mile an hour wind to it. So you can see, and of course with Google Earth, now I can really get an idea of the terrain. In fact, I in this unit, I'm going to flip this thing all the way around. So I'm looking out of it from out of the south. Now you can really get a much better idea of what's happening. So again, now the wind is coming, still a west wind, but now you can see, the reason this we had a greater rate of spread here is because you can see the fuel model change, right? It's much more grassy. The other, so then that's with just the regular west wind. Now I could turn those off and turn on my wind switch and see what, now that's now that's if my wind switched on me and I can see now again you can get a much better idea of the terrain here of what would happen if I had that switch and the fire moved outside of my boundary off to the uh, west remember I flipped the map around so we're actually looking south right now but that's the beautiful thing about Google Earth right is we can we can we can take a look at all different angles here and see uh and, and really look at the terrain, the access, and that should all play into our holding plan. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you guys. Um, I've got this presentation and I'm gonna share it with everybody. So you can, you know, click through things if you want. Um, let me just, uh, so I got a little summary here. And these are my little, let me give you my little take home messages. Just, it'll oh, make me feel better if I do that. So here, here they are. So these are my take home messages, right? You don't have to be an analyst to use IFTDIS. It's actually fairly straightforward. 
it's, it's behave, it, a version of behave on a map, right? Same input, same outputs. Um, the MTT is a little more advanced, but that's okay. We can get some help with that if we're new to it. The maps are really cool and they're super useful. Remember to me, location is everything. The numbers are important, but location might be more important. Um, so keep those things in mind when you consider using this. And then it can just be really powerful to help you understand your landscape, your fuel models, and those critical holding areas and how they might uh, really affect your plan. So that's kind of what I wanted to share. Um, I'm going to package this up for you guys to use later on if you want or share with other folks who didn't maybe make it to the uh, to the meeting today. And um, we're also going to try to put together um, kind of a resource page for folks. So uh, there'll be like a website or maybe something in the learning portal. So you could go back and review a lot of this. And um, the second thing I'll offer up is we are going to bring a number of detailers on that we're hiring through NAFRI. And the hope is that we'll get them sort of a train the trainer deal where they'll we'll get them a little bit trained up and then we can send them out to the field to help folks more of like a one-on-one -on -one or maybe a hands-on workshop type of thing if you guys want to learn some more about this stuff hands-on i know that was really fast that was a lot of info um but hopefully that gave you a flavor of what's available out there and uh and what you guys can use so thanks for having me is there any questions or stuff? I, like I said, I know I flew through that. Anything from the uh, folks online that wanted to add to something I missed or maybe glazed over more than I should have? Hey, Kim, this is Vic. I, I have a question, I guess, while folks are thinking. Um, sure. When you went over the compare weather feature, your first slide kind of showed a scenario where wind was was static in terms of prescription, and then you stair step to find it all the fuel moistures. And Actually, just I left the I left the fuel moistures the same. The only thing I changed was the uh, was the wind. Okay, I, I saw a max wind of say fifteen, and then depending on if you were in the high, low, or moderate, oh, your yep. your fine deads and your fuel moistures changed. And I was just wondering if 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 it just has the ability to flip that where maybe absolutely okay yep yeah you can totally pick and choose what parameters you'd like to vary so if you really just want to see like the effect of fuel moisture like eh, we usually get pretty consistent wind but what happens if we get a drop in rh or or we're going to burn under a much drier spring or or fall than we normally would yeah you can totally vary those on on any piece of the uh of the weather component yep Good question. Any other questions? Thanks, guys. Like I said, I'll package this stuff up so you can you can have it at your um, whenever you want to mess with it or share it or out mm -hmm. however it goes. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for your time. Thanks, and thanks for recording it. We're going to try to share this with some of the other uh, refreshers that we've been asked to help with. So. Appreciate it. Great. Five minute break, and then we'll get started with the